Leaders. Real life leaders. Hey guys, I'm so excited. We have the author of This Is Not His Only Book, but my favorite. It's called Profit First with Mike Michalowicz. And we are so excited. We've got Heather Rimmick with us. So go ahead, Mike, tell listeners who've been hiding under a rock who don't know about you, tell them about yourself and about your other works as well. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And uh, I strongly suspect no one's hiding under a rock. It, the work I'm doing um, is getting popularity. I'm and thrilled, but I still have a lot of people to discover this work and hopefully serve them. Uh, so I'm an author of for small business owners. Um, and my background is I'm a small business owner myself. I've been for my entire adult life, ever since I left college, I, I've run businesses and I've had some um, significant successes, at least in my definition, a couple of exits and sold companies and so forth. And, and I became a millionaire in my early thirties. But I think the more significant part of my story is I lost it all too. I, I started a company um, as an angel investor. I was horrible at it. And I, I evaporated all my wealth and, and struggled. And it really became that point, uh, that turning moment for me it was, it was the inception of at least the understanding. I didn't understand the basic principles of successful entrepreneurship, even though I thought I did. And so I started to write it and document the process of what actually does work and what I think works that doesn't. And it became very clear to me that I need to write books about that. Now for the last 11 or 12 years, I've devoted myself full time to being an author. And uh, and honestly, in my books, I'm, I'm fixing problems I have with my own businesses and hopefully helping many other people in their journey too. So I loved reading this book. And in your book, you give a lot of really great stories. And one thing we love to talk about is like real life stories. So what I loved reading about in your book was I felt like I was in these people's lives that you were telling. And I just wanted to ask you, what was your favorite story that you got to tell in the book? Oh, it was definitely the story of Jesse Cole and his wife, Emily Cole. They are the founders of a baseball team. And I'm not going to reveal the name. I'll leave that as a little bit of a cliffhanger. I'll share in a second. But the success the business has had is is uncomparable in, compared to any other baseball team. No one's achieved their growth in, in profitability and uh, just success. And it was interesting. I got a baseball card from this team owner, Jesse Cole, and he says, hey, we use Profit First and it's changed the way baseball operates. Now, it's a minor league team, um, but they're more profitable than any other team in their league, they're more profitable on a percentage basis than actually the vast majority of major league teams. And uh, this this little minor league stadium, the average attendance to a minor league game, by the way, is about 300 people, gets 5,000 people. And they're the only team in history to sell out four consecutive seasons, not ticket sales, actual attendance, sellouts, four consecutive seasons. And 2020 is going to be their fifth. And so th- th- here's the team. It's called the Savannah Bananas. You need to Google this team. What I love about their story, Heather, is that they embrace profit first and they realize that um, that for them to be successful, they had to amplify the entertainment. People, baseball, shockingly, is kind of boring. You need to be more entertaining, yet they couldn't afford entertainment in the traditional sense. They started to change the paradigm of how these games operate. And so if you're a baseball player for the team, the Savannah Bananas, your first day of practice is not about throwing and catching better. It's actually about how to line dance. And you, you the, the, they will open these games up and the team is line dancing. Um, they will they do these crazy antics. They have this thing called the banana in the pants guests at the the stadium run to the upper deck of the stadium and there's bunches of bananas up there and they are throwing bananas off the stands and baseball players in these balloon like pants are trying to catch the bananas in their pants. Um, But my favorite thing was I I went to a game two years ago and uh, all of a sudden the announcer comes on and he goes, we would like any parents who here who are willing to donate their baby uh, for the opening ceremony. And I'm like, what? Mothers, with the infants are running down concrete steps, like, like their footballs running down to the, the stadium floor and they are, are presenting their babies. Well, they select randomly one of the babies and put them in a little baby uh, banana costume. They then bring the baby to the pitcher's mound and all the baseball players around them doing this hand motion and the baby you can't see because the, the owner's holding him under it. And all of a sudden on the speakers, you hear Lion King's Akuna Matata crank up and they, the, the, uh, owner comes out of the mound holding the baby up and the audience loses their and that's how the game starts and um and that's just the beginning of it it is extreme constant entertainment 
all based upon the fact that they had to increase profitability. The essence of the story shortly is this. When you focus on profitability, you have to find alternative ways to deliver what the customers want with spending less money, which forces more innovation. I would argue they're the most innovative baseball team you've ever seen. It's like the Harlem Globetrotters plus 10 in baseball. And as a result, they're wildly successful, wildly popular, and wildly profitable. Awesome. Well, one of the things that I love is that you want people to actually learn how to save more than spending. And that's an art. So I love that you say that. And I want you to give just a couple of tips in your books, like give them a tasting before they buy your book. Yeah, um, it is an emotional so that statement. Actually, I uh, as Susie Orman who said that, and I, I've never been a Susie Orman fan per se, but when I heard this line, I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. It is a behavioral shift. We put more significance and more joy and satisfaction to savings. That's the day you become rich. And in the book, what I share are really simple behavioral principles to drive profitably in your business. And what's, what's key is, is that if we try to change ourselves, we will struggle and often fail. If we channel who we already are to the outcomes we want, we're more likely successful. Real quick example, I, I am a believe in the importance of exercise. Um, I don't necessarily enjoy the process of exercise, but I do enjoy the feeling after exercise. I used to have my gym shoes in the closet, and when I get up in the morning, I would avoid the closet, drink a cup of coffee, and, and down a donut. Um, so I learned about this concept called behavioral intercepts. Look at our current behavior and put it in our pathway. I realize every time I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I march into the bathroom. So I now put my sneakers on top of the toilet seat. Every time I go to the bathroom, I cannot use the bathroom without grabbing my sneakers now. And that's the first small step to getting in the gym. I'm like, they're my hands now. Might as well put my feet. They're on my feet now. I might as well walk down to the gym. I'm at the gym now. Might as well work out. So it starts this waterfall effect. With profit first, what we have to understand is the vast majority of small business owners don't know basic accounting um, and shouldn't. We don't know how to read income statements, really. We definitely don't know how to read cash flow statements and balance sheets. I, I still don't. And uh, we don't know how to tie those in together, even though that's what we're told what to do. That's sneakers in the closet. What we need to do is intercept our behavioral path. Most entrepreneurs log into their bank account and see if they have money or not. If I have money, I can spend it. If I don't, I can panic. So if we're logging into our bank account, the first Significant tip is set up a profit account and other accounts at your bank. Now, as money flows into your bank, first allocate money, actually transfer that money to a profit account, perhaps tax reserves and so forth. And now when you log into your bank account, you see what money is reserved for what purpose. And then the, the second kind of tip I share in the book is removing temptation. There's a lot to talk about temptation, particularly around food. I love chocolate chip cookies, and I found willpower is a bunch of nonsense. I, it doesn't work. Willpower is like a muscle. It fatigues. I can say no to chocolate chip cookies about five or six times before I take a little nibble, and then game's over. I'm eating the whole batch. <laughs> so so what my, my family's done is um, I'm trying to prepare for an athletic event with my son. I, I've learned that i got to avoid bad carbs. Uh, there's no cookies at our house. And uh, no surprise, with no cookies at the house, I don't eat them. What happens is we allocate money toward profit using the profit first system and other responsibilities. Some of those monies need to sit there for a period of time, but if they sit there, it's tempting to borrow from ourselves. So what we're gonna do is actually transfer that money from the one bank that we actively use to a hidden account at another bank. So it's out of sight and out of mind. And this way we've removed the cookies from the table. And we're not gonna consume that profit inappropriately to fund a business. Profit should always be used to reward the shareholder, but not be reinserted in the business. And by removing it, we prevent that temptation from happening. One of the things I think, especially like small business owners or people that are just starting out, think bigger is better, right? So I like, I'm going to be big, big, big. But one thing that I love that you say is bigger is not always better. So can you tell them maybe just like a real life example of a business that you've known that tried to go really big, but they had no profit? Yeah. So, so this Yahoo you're looking at right now, me. Like I, I so bought into that. I so bought into that success happens at a certain point. And so when I started my very first business, it was doing computer systems. I was, you know, when I said, when I make $50,000 in revenue for this business, I'll be making $50,000 for me. And um, once the company hit $50,000 in revenue, I was making zero. And I said, oh, maybe it's at 100,000 where I'll make some money. And when I hit 100,000 in revenue, I made nothing. And then I said, maybe it's 250 or maybe it's a million. And there was no threshold big enough for me to support myself. And what happened was this manic kind of response saying, oh, we need to grow faster. 
the problem with the focus on size is two things. First of all, it's a vanity metric. So as my business got to $1 million, $2 million in revenue, I was this big guy, big jerk, walking around pounding my chest saying, look how successful I am. I have a $2 million business. You know, you're not that big. Or when someone said, oh, they have a $5 million, I said, okay, I need to be $7 million. And I focused on achieving that. So first of all, it's a vanity metric. It's comparing something that's, that's fluff, cotton candy. It, it, it doesn't provide any value. There's a saying that revenue is vanity, profit is sanity. But the second element that I didn't realize is the bigger the business got, the more sales I had, the more organizational stress I had. And what I mean by this is every time more revenue comes into an organization, the more obligation that organization, my company had. So as I made more sales, I just install more computer systems. And with greater organizational stress, being a small business owner, that meant more stress on me, the superhero for the business that tried to fix everything. So more revenue, bigger size was more stress for me. And, and it, it started to compromise my health. So when people talk about size of business, like I did all the time incessantly, I now ask a new question. When someone's like, hey, tell me about your business. How big is it? And often they don't like ask about revenue. It's a little bit uncomfortable. So they'll say, how many employees do you have? Which is basically the same question. I say, hey, let me, let's, I think this is going to be an interesting conversation. Let's start off with another question. Let's talk about how healthy our business is. And that's when I get the deer in the headlights. Like, what do you mean? Like, how profitable are you? How sustainable? What's your reserves in cash? Let's talk about that. And then people are like, uh, uh, I don't want to talk to this guy and I'm out of here. I, I want to change the conversation from the how big is it contest to the how healthy is your business contest. One of the things that Gary Keller started doing at Keller Williams, I actually spoke on his stage at Keller Williams. And one of the things they said is, can you send us a copy of your P&L? And they said, and the reason is, is because they had all these people who were like killing it. They were selling thousands and thousands of homes. But when you looked at their profit, they were making nothing. And so he was like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, you're selling all these homes, but you're not making any money. So now before you speak on his stage, you actually have to show your P&L to show that you're highly profitable before he'll let you on the stage. And I was like, I actually think this is really smart. I love this. So I sent them my P&L. I actually just met with Gary a few months ago. I went to their Austin office and uh, they, they have an auditorium. This is how successful that business is. They have an auditorium at that headquarters and his office. I don't know if you've been to his office. He's right next to it. There's that little telephone booth he's got and he walks out and there he is on stage. And um, I was blown away by that exact point was the focus was on the health of an organization. And that's a rarity. I think a lot of us are sold on, hey, if you become a real estate agent, you'll make a lot of money. But the question is not how much you'll make, how much will you take? And that's, I think, the focus I saw Gary share. So one of the things I was telling someone about your book and they said, yeah, 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 I understand. But I'm kind of doing the Amazon model where I'm like, you know, I'm not as focused on profit right now. And Amazon for years and years, they were focused on just pouring money back into their systems. And he's like, I'm just going to spend, spend, spend right now. And I'm not worried about profit. What would you say to someone who that was their objection? It's abrupt, but you've bet on the lottery. You know, it's funny. So we see lottery winners and they make a hundred million dollars. And then some people say, oh, the lottery is a way to make money. It is not. For the one million, the one winner of hundreds of millions, there are hundreds of millions of losers that contributed to that a dollar or two. The Amazon is an outlier. And I don't think people appreciate that. To say that the Amazon, Amazon way is the way to success is not true because they are one of hundreds of millions of businesses that are successful through fundamental basic principles of becoming profitable from day one. You know, if we treat profit as an event, an eventuality, it's a pot shot. Profit needs to be a habit, needs to be baked into every transaction of our business. I'm not I, I'm not putting Amazon down. It's a tremendous success. It is impressive. And there's a lot to be learned there. I'm just, not, I'm just saying that is not a likely pathhood to successful business or pathway to successful business. I love that. that yeah. That's great. So a lot of companies have se seasonal shifts, like even us in real estate. So obviously like, you know, there's some months where we have massive amount of sales and then you have some months that are just slower. Luckily for us, we're pretty steady, but there are a lot of companies out there like lawn care, real estate agents, like all these different companies that have high seasons and low seasons. What advice can you give them so they don't have to lay off higher, have higher layoffs or like hire their forces? 
Yeah, I call that the starvation and gluttony experience. And, and this happens, it can happen in diets, right? I, I don't know if you've ever experienced it. I've done this where, you know, I'm late for work. I skip a meal uh, at lunch, maybe. And, and then by the time dinner comes around, I'm in this starvation mode. So I'm at peak hunger. So what do I do? I pack in the food. I'm like, oh my God, I can't stop eating. And then about 20 minutes later, I feel the gluttonous state. I've overeaten. Oh my God, I'll never eat again until, you know, the next morning I'm starving and I'm jamming food down again. Well, what they found when it comes to diets is that this concept of three meals a day works against us. It actually forces overeating because we have the built up hunger. The optimal meal frequency is five meals a day, five small meals. So you never go into a peak hunger state, therefore you never overconsume. It actually controls your caloric intake. Well, businesses have the same kind of starvation mode and gluttony mode. Money, you know, we need money so bad, sell anything to anybody. We land that big deal. Now we're flush with cash, we're gluttonous. We're like, oh my gosh, I can spend this anywhere. Life's amazing. And the next day, life sucks, it's all gone. So that's these peaks and valleys. The way to moderate it is by getting into a frequency that frequently kind of chipping away at small portions of it. Specifically, I would set up another account with a, a rule here in our office, as we say, if in doubt, add an account. We add an account because we, I, in my own business, have the same kind of um, peaks and valleys. When the money flows in for, we get retainers well in advance, we'll take that money and put it into an account called Drip. And uh, how we get accounts, uh, retainers are usually in for, for three to four months of work. So we'll get a big retainer, we'll put it into this drip account and then we'll cut it into four pieces. Every month we'll take out one fourth of that. So say $40,000 comes in, 40,000 comes in, we'll cut one fourth of that $10,000 and put that in the income account and flow it out into the accounts. Then next month we'll take one tenth of, one fourth of that and put 10,000 in again. And so now instead of feeling that like we have tons of money, it's dripping into our business at a much more level rate. And now we start behaving response really good all right i got a question for you i've heard you say don't go full, full throttle into profit first you know we love some like a practical example like say a standard business maybe that brings ten thousand in in some months and then just a thousand in others what would you say they should start doing like what's something maybe someone can have practical steps to get started yeah so regardless of how much it comes in and what frequency uh it comes in start with profit first very slow and then let it grow what I mean by this is let's just have one account. If you've never done profit first before, just set up a profit account and then allocate a small amount. I usually suggest even just 1%. So because it's a percentage-based system, the income volatility doesn't matter because it's a, it's a piece, a percentage of whatever pie comes in. So if 10,000 comes in, 1%, if my numbers are right, is $100. Because if you can run your business off 10 grand, you can run your business off 900, 9,900. I, I think that's probably not questionable. But now you've reserved 100 bucks. And, and the next time 1,000 bucks comes in, I'm saying take 10 bucks now. Because if you can run your business off 1,000, you can run off 990. But now we've consistently started establishing this habit of profit. And what we found, and we're very blessed, we have over 300,000 companies that have implemented profit first and it's growing now almost hitting an exponential growth curve. And what we found is that these businesses that start very slowly, but to stick with the discipline of 1%, maybe it takes a couple months, maybe it takes longer, but then they move to 2%. And they say, what if I do three or four or five? And then they say, what if I introduce those other components, OPEX and tax and so forth? And they can slowly roll this out. And uh, for most businesses, the rollout's over six months, even a year before they're in the full profit first mode. But by doing the profit first first, they've committed to the you know building that profit muscle from day one. And do you have an amount where you say, I know different people like Gary Keller says he wants people to make 30% in the real estate industry as profit. So, you know, do you kind of have a system where you say, if you're between this size and this size, you should be making this percent of profit or what kind of guidelines do you have on that? We do. And in the book, uh, I documented um, different revenue ranges and where the fiscally elite companies are performing. And we studied, uh, it was industry agnostic. So we, we studied everything from pizza shops. Uh, we actually investigated the church. We looked at um, professional services, podcasters, but we looked in every category, which ones were the best performing in that category fiscally. And, and we determined, oh, these are the percentages they achieve. So in Profit First, for every revenue range that we categorized like zero to 250, 250 to 500, 500 to a mil and so forth, we identified the different percentages that these fiscally elite businesses were allocating. And it is my belief, my strong belief, that any business can become part of the fiscally elite if you know what the definition of the fiscally elite is. And so with Profit First, we say, here's what we're targeting. We call it TAPS, Target Allocation Percentages. You today are sitting wherever you are, maybe no profitability, maybe uh, actually accumulating debt. And here, now you know where we're headed. We're going to take small but persistent and consistent steps to get there. And maybe it takes us three or four years to become part of the fiscally elite. But if we keep 
keep taking small steps, the likelihood of achieving the outcome, because we have clarity on what it is, is much greater than otherwise. So we are actually in 20 states right now. And, you know, some of our people who manage the different states, they kind of make excuses. Like some of them are really profitable and they're doing really well. And some of them just kind of make one excuse after another of why they're not as profitable in that area. You know, what, what would you say to that person? Yeah. So my first observation is he sounds very human. <laughs> he sounds like the rest of us because it is human nature to when we're in a position to defend that position. Um, there was a study, this is so funny, of husbands and wives, uh, when they had conflict, they first interviewed the husbands. They said, when you have a conflict, how often are you actually the right party? And the husband said about 80% of the time I'm right and she's wrong. They then went to the wives and said, in conflict, how often are you right? And the woman said, 80% of the time I'm right and he's wrong. So statistically, that's impossible. But, but from our vantage point, it's a human nature to defend and protect our actions. Otherwise, we drive ourselves insane. So I first just want to recognize what he's feeling, I'm sure is very true to him, uh, because it's the only way to be at peace with ourselves. Um, then I would simply go not to the technical, like, you got to do this, you got to do that. I, I would ask, his commitment to its importance. How important is it for you to be profitable? And um, how, at what level are you committed to the profitability of this branch? How much does it speak to you? How badly do you want this and are committed to it? And once you get that level of commitment, and he may say, listen, I, I just want a job. And, and that may be his integral truth, or he may say, I want to be profitable more than anything. Then saying, are you so desirous of being profitable that you're willing to even consider stuff that you're doing right now is not effective? Uh, and there may be alternatives that you're not aware of yet. Are you that committed to profitability to even challenge yourself? And that's a real visceral question too. Some people say, you know what? No, I'm not. I, I know what I'm doing is right, which means I'm committed to sticking stock. He may say, oh, my commitment to profitability is that great. When I can get someone to viscerally commit to the outcome, then the path reveals itself. If I challenge people saying, you know what you're doing is not working, we got to change things. That's when people come entrenched in defending their approach. Well, that was amazing. If you haven't got his book, you should. And I want you to know that you, Mike, are doing an amazing job at changing people's lives and making business is better. So tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Oh, thank you for offering that. So my website, while it is Mike Michalowicz, there is a shortcut. It's Mike Motorbike. Uh, here's the irony. I've never driven a motorcycle. Uh, <laughs> but, but that was my nickname in high school. And my old high school friends still say, hey, it's Mike Motorbike. So go to MikeMotorbike.com. It'll bring you to my site. And um, there's a few things I offer there for free download. And it's literally just, just enter your email and everything's given to you in one shot. There's no subscription or anything. Everything's in one shot. All my books, I'll give you, uh, I think, two or three chapters. And not just like the intro fluff, like the impactful, actionable chapters. Um, I used to write for the Wall Street Journal. So you'll get all those articles. I have my own podcast called Entrepreneurship Elevated. I'll give you a link to that. And um, yeah, just hope it, it serves the entrepreneurial community. You guys stay with us. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Life Leadership. If you'd like to get the show notes or access more resources, log on to reallifeleaders.com slash podcast to get the show notes from this episode and any other resources we might have mentioned. And also, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to review or rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. And if you have any leadership questions you want answered, email podcast at reallifeleaders.com. 